Uh, if you would, just turn to your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I'll be there eventually. What I'm going to be talking about today is three things. Hold fast, stand firm, and trust forever. Hold fast, stand firm, trust forever. Let me open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this day, Lord. Pray, God, that you would give me of thy spirit, Lord, to edify and strengthen your people, Lord. Give me the message that is needed at such a time as this. And I'll thank you for it. Uh, God, only you can do what needs to be done in the hearts of your people today. And it's in their name, Lord, that I'm here. And I pray, God, that you would do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If there's never an example of somebody who, who held fast, who, who, who stood strong in times of adversity and, and trials and tribulation, it was, it was Job. Quite often when I'm going through something that is difficult, I will think to Job and, and realize that, hey, maybe my life isn't so bad. Maybe my situation isn't so hard. Because if you think of somebody like Job, you recognize very clearly that he, he went through the, the uttermost of what any man could could possibly be put through, and yet he stood the test, and in the end, the Bible says he was more blessed, the latter end of Job was more blessed than he was at the beginning. And it all, it all was a bookend, you know, Job living very, very wealthy, very, very well-to-do, had a great big family at the beginning of his life, and then what we have in the scriptures is, is the middle, and that, that's the trials, the, the, the tribulations, the temptations, the struggles that Job went through. And then the end of his life, we see again, he was blessed in his latter end. But it's that stuff in the middle it's, it, that's hardest for Christians often to get through. We see in the story of Job that, that he had great loss and great pain in his life at this time that was recorded in the scriptures, as he lost all of his wealth. Uh, he lost all of his family, and he was left alone at this time. We see it also followed that, that, that when just on the heels of such a loss and such a terrible thing, he started to face infirmity of his flesh and anguish. Uh, the Bible describes great boils that were sore upon his body from the head to the toe. So much the word in order to get relief, he would take a stone and try to scrape these things off because it would ease that, that burning or that itching or, or, or whatever kind of pain he was. So we can only imagine what it must have been like to not only have, have your outside world all, all destroyed, but then also your very flesh destroyed and hurting and suffering. And yet Job held fast, he stood firm, he remained resolved to trust forever. In the midst of all these adversities even, Job, I said he lost everybody, but his wife remained in his life, and these three well-meaning friends that showed up to offer wonderful pieces of advice and support and counsel, like as his wife said, Job just cursed God and died. Man, when all that you're going through and the one that you're closest with comes to you and gives you such sound advice like curse God and die, just, just get it over with. It's, it's done. It's enough. His friends come and they say, Job, what did you do? How would God curse you in such a way? You must have sinned, blaming him as if he had wronged the Lord. And yet Job remained standing fast, standing firm, and trusting the Lord through this. In Job chapter 27, we find right in the middle of all the accusations of his friends that, that Job, you must have sinned. Job, you must have done wrong. The only way that this could be happening in your life is because you have sinned against the Lord. Job continues and speaks this parable. In verse 27, Job says, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. He says this, he says, My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Despite all that he was going through, he was minded to keep his tongue. Job was minded to retain his integrity. He decided that he was going to hold fast to his righteousness, not justifying the attacks and accusations that were coming at him. 
from his well-meaning friends. And he decided he was going to guard his heart. Job showed a great poise. He showed great strength and resolve in the most difficult time that he ever faced in his life. And none of us can compare, even in our own situations, the, the struggle that Job faced. And yet too often, we're the first ones to slip of the tongue. We're the first to, to uh, let go of our righteousness at this time and start to backslide as we fall into reproach and condemnation and struggles and hard times. We, we find that our, our heart's not guarded and rather open to whatever kind of worldly carnal thing will give us pleasure at that time. But the example is there of Job, who showed poise, resolve, and strength. So I want to encourage you today, church, to hold fast, stand firm, and trust forever in the Lord, in the hard times, in the struggles, in all the things that life throws at you. Don't necessarily think it's always God just trying to throw these struggles, throw these hardships, throw these troubles into your life. But life itself, the Bible says that rain falls on the just and on the unjust. The, the, the things of this world, the, 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 the things that come upon us, you're not special. Everyone's had hard times. Everyone has struggles. But as a Christian, you have the power. You have the ability to make the decision to hold fast, stand firm, and trust forever in these times. How do you turn to Hebrews chapter 3? We're going to talk first about hold fast. Job made this statement. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Hebrews chapter 3 talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe when you're going through some things, it is best to consider him. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So we see here that the Lord Jesus was faithful unto the commands, the appointment of his father when he came upon earth. And even so, we see that Moses was made an example of that same resolve as he was faithful in all his house. Verse 3 says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. So he is counted more worthy than Moses. And why is that? Because he built Moses. Verse 4 says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. So we are now considering the Lord Jesus Christ, who was faithful unto God, who appointed him to the job that he had to do. And he is esteemed more highly than Moses because he made Moses, because he is the living God. But I will give you this. Holding fast is not something that is just restricted to God. Being faithful in what you're appointed to in this life is not something that is just restricted to God because we have here parallel in this passage, Moses' story. The Bible says here that Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken hereafter. So Moses showed forth that same servant mentality when as a testimony unto others that we can behold in the scriptures, he was faithful in all his house. Verse 6 says, But Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope unto the end. So while Moses served as a servant in all his house, Christ as a son was over all his house. And the Bible says, which house are ye? Which house are we if we hold fast that confidence? If we hold fast that rejoicing unto the end? Christ's power resides within his house, which he is overseer of. And you are that house, the Bible is clear. Therefore, the power of God is upon you, and we ought to consider that whenever we're going through struggles. Whenever we start to feel as if we are not going to be able to hold fast in this situation, the Bible says, no, that the power of God is upon you if we hold fast that confidence. What is confidence? That's faith. That's trust. That's dependence on the living God. And if we rejoice 
in the hope that is set before us. The Bible is clear that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And your glorying is only because Christ resides within you. You are his spiritual house, the Bible says. Consider that next time you're going through struggles. If Christ can go through all he did, and I believe he went above and beyond even what Job had to suffer here upon earth. Um, if he can go through it, you need to let him go through the same situations that you're in by his power working in you. That is the hope of glory. We need to hold fast that confidence by faith. We need to rejoice in the hope of glory that Christ resides in us and helps us to overcome those situations, those adversities, those struggles. And we need to abide in that. Hold fast to that truth. Christ will get you through if you let him. Amen. If you have confidence and faith and trust that he will. If you believe in him, even in every situation that life throws in you. That is the rejoicing that comes through you. Hey, you're maybe going through the lowest of the low situation you've ever been in in your life. You can be confident and trust in Christ to carry you through. And you can rejoice in the hope of glory that shall be revealed in you. Why? Because Christ in you is that hope of glory. And if you're saved today, you have that hope ready, available, willing for you to just rest in it. Amen. Turn the page, it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So we saw Jesus as that example upon earth. Then we saw a man like Moses living out that same example through the pages of the scriptures. Then we walk those same situations in our life. And we can do it from the standpoint that Christ did this upon earth. He experienced that with men upon earth. He has gone through the same things here upon earth. But now the Bible says he is our great high priest. Passed into the heavens. Let us hold fast that profession. While we can seek God for power here upon earth, remember that Christ is no longer residing here upon earth. Glory to God, he is, he is risen. He sits at the right hand of God and Father, eternal in heaven, waiting for you to come on to him, waiting for you to ask him for strength, waiting for you to ask him in prayer to lift you through such and such and such a situation. Just like the Bible records in these next few verses of verse 15. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Christ was tempted with the same infirmities, the feelings of the infirmities that you have, the feelings of the struggles, the trials, the tribulations. Christ isn't ignorant of those. He understands very well what you're going through. Why? Because he came down and purposefully, by appointment of God the Father, lived those same situations, infirmities, uh, the same struggles, the same temptations that you have been put upon. But now it says this, Let us therefore, because he is the high priest, because he is settled in heaven, because he is sitting there, and we have that profession that we can hold upon, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may have Take mercy and find grace in the time of need. Hey. Next time you're in need, go boldly to the throne of grace. Next time you're in need, hold fast to that profession that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, waiting for you to bring that need unto Him. And when you do, you're not going to a God that doesn't understand you. You're not going to a God that doesn't get why you're feeling that way, why you have that need. You're going to a God that is touched with the feeling of your infirmities. And he is ready and willing, empathetic to the pain that you have, uh, hurting because of the pain that you have, uh, fellowshipping with you in that same suffering, looking upon you and saying, yes, Step boldly before me, my son. Step boldly before me, my daughter. And I can give you mercy. You will find grace in this time of need. That is how we hold fast. We stand on the profession. We stand on the faith. We have confidence. We have rejoicing in the hope that you are not holding fast on your own, in of your own strength. You are not struggling in this life, trying to get through, trying to obtain, trying to succeed, trying to get yourself out of your struggles. No, hold fast unto Christ. And when you hold fast unto Christ, it is His strength that will provide mercy. It is His his being, his, his who he is, that will provide 
the grace to help you in Amen. the time of need. Hold fast, Christian. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to strive. You don't need to fight and kick against this world all the time. You just need to hold on and allow Christ to do Amen. all that for you. Allow Christ to fight for you. The Bible says this. It says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And the proving of all things, turn to 2 Timothy 3 if you would, or 2 Timothy 1. The proving all things means that we're to be Christians of discernment. We're to look at situations. We're to look at what's going on in our life. We're to prove them. We're to send them through the trying of our own understanding, through the pages of the scriptures. We're to go through the Bible and to prove all things that are going on in your life and hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast, Christians, to that which is good. 2 Timothy in verse 1, the Bible reads this. Sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The Bible here is saying, hold fast to the form of sound words. Well, where are you going to get sound words? You're going to get them from the scriptures. This is the only place where you're going to find sound, secure, right, promised, perfect, pure words is from the scriptures. Amen. This verse is very close to me because the church that we are planning up there in North York is called Sound Words Baptist Church. And is that for a reason? Because if we are to let go of, if we're not to hold fast to the form of sound words, wouldn't be much of a church then, would we? But the Bible is clear. Hold fast to the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. The Apostle Paul here talking to Timothy. But all he's doing is pointing back to the Holy Bible saying, Yeah, you've heard these of me, but it's the scriptures. That good thing you are to keep by the power of God that abideth within you. The Bible says this. It says, Not by my sword, not by my might, but by his spirit. And that's what verse 14, it says, Keep it by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. I can go through and I can memorize page by page by page by page of the Bible, and I can commit that to my memory, but my memory is short, and it fades as I get older, or as I memorize something and then start to live out my life, eventually I'll forget it. But the keeping of the sound words, that form of sound words within you, comes because it's held by the Holy Ghost. Doesn't the Bible teach that He shall bring all things into our remembrance whatsoever I have taught you? You can believe because you've trusted upon Christ. And if you've trusted on Christ, it's because you've heard of Christ within the Word of God. Hold fast to that. The Bible says in verse 12, it says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which was committed unto him against that day. The Bible doesn't talk about us holding fast, about us being strong, about us being conquerors. The Bible talks about Him being strong, Him being the conqueror, Him being the overcomer. And that is what you need to put your trust in when you're holding fast unto anything. It's to God Himself. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. Are you persuaded today? Can you hold fast that form of profession? Can you hold fast to the form of sound words which you're hearing even this morning? When you read the scriptures, do you believe them? Do you hold to them? Are they your living and breathing? Are they your being? Because they must be Christian. If you have anything to hold fast to, it's the scriptures. There is nothing else. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Your commitment, your profession has to be in him. Your commitment and your holding fast needs to be unto him. Or you're going to be tossed about. You're going to be turned aside in this world. You're going to be swept away. But if you're holding unto Christ, you'll stand firm. Amen. Point two, stand firm. Hold fast was point one. Stand firm is point two. Ephesians chapter six, famous verse. Ephesians chapter six. Hold fast, stand firm, trust forever. Ephesians chapter six, and in verse 10, the Bible says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Isn't that the opposite of what the world teaches you today? The world teaches you that you've got to be strong in yourself. You've got to believe in yourself, that you need to have your own strength and your own might. 
But finally, the Apostle Paul has given this charge to the Ephesians. The last thing he's going to say to them, finally, he doesn't say lift yourselves up by your bootstraps. He doesn't say pull up your socks and get out there and get to work. No, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. It says this, put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about, and it continues on and on and on. It tells you of the whole armor of God and the various pieces of it. But you'll find here four times it says, Stand that ye may be able to withstand, having done all to stand. Stand therefore. And as a Christian, it is your duty to stand firm. Not in your own convictions, not in your own desires, not in your own ideas as some sort of stubborn person always trying to push against the Lord. No, we're to stand firm, stand strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Too often we want to stand in our own might, and that's when we become puffed up. That's when we think we're self-made people. There's no such thing as a self-made Christian. God birthed you. God made you. God created you. You give Him all the glory. You stand firm in that. You will never, Christian, never stand in the power of your own might. That's why the charge here is to stand, stand therefore, withstand in the Lord, and having done all to stand, stand. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. If you can and will. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. I'll begin reading in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians and that we should die in the wilderness. This is the story of the of the the people of Israel when they were in Egypt, and as they stepped out by faith after the Passover took place, they're now marching through at the command of Pharaoh to get out, to leave this land, and halfway across into the Red Sea, Pharaoh had a change of mind and decided to pursue after them. And so now, the people who are unarmed, the people who are unable, the people who are mostly children, who are marching, who are famished, who were slaves before this, are now marching in the greatest army in the world is closing in behind them. They have lost track of the reason why they had left Egypt in the first place. They were under struggles. They were under bondage. They were under the weight of the world crashing down upon them, under Pharaoh's dominion. And therefore, God sent Moses to say, let my people go that they may serve me. But now they're forgetting. They're looking back as if the bondage of Egypt was a good thing compared to the eight great army coming to slay them. They are losing sight of the fact that this is God moving in the direction to have them liberated from the bondage that they were in. And too often when we pray to be have, have release from our struggles, there's this little bit of moment of time compared to eternity. There's this little space of time compared to eternity where things might get a little more difficult. And it's in that time when quite often Christians, instead of thinking, maybe God is using this, start to go, oh, you know, it wasn't so bad when I was in this pain. It wasn't so bad when I was in that situation because what's happening right now is far worse. Why am I in this? Why am I going through this? They're, they're charging Moses here in God's stead saying, it was better for us when we were slaves. It was better for us when we were servants to the world. It was better for us before we were saved from that bondage. They have looked at the temporary struggle that they're in, not as God moving in the area of deliverance, but 
as if this is their demise. There is great fear here. There is great doubt. And fear and doubt before God in the Christian's life is sin, people. You are not to fear anything but God. And so we have a whole congregation of people in great sin, in great fear, in great doubt of God who's able to provide for them. Moses here at this time, he didn't stand up and say, Hey, chin up, man up, buck up, get up. Fight! We can do this! Now look what he said, verse 3, 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show unto you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more forever. He didn't say, chin up, man up, buck up, stand up. He said, shut up. He said, stand and see the salvation of the Lord. And Christian, it is your job, it is your duty, when you are going through struggles, when you are praying that God would help you through a certain situation, to stand and see. Having done all to stand, right? Remember the armor. Stand, withstand, stand, stand, just stand. And this is the exact story. This is how it plays out. Yeah, you may be going through some things. It may be hard. It may be difficult. But what is easier in the Christian life than to just stand? Just withstand it. Just bear with it. Stand and see. Not stand and see your demise. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. And this is what Moses charges. He says in verse 14, The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. In other words, stop talking. Stop worrying. Stop struggling. Stop doubting. Stop being in fear. Stand and see yeah. the salvation of the Lord. Man. His great glory is coming. Stand firm on Him. Stand firm on the solid rock that is Christ. Man. See, His great glory is going to come. But it may not be on in your eyesight. It may not be in your timing. You may not understand all the things that you're going through. And every one of us in our lives has hardships, struggles, pains, anguish, torments. Just things that you would just wish would go. But when you pray for those to be removed from your life... Don't be surprised when your life suddenly gets worse for a moment of time. It's just a little bit of a proving ground. It's just a little bit of a trial. It's just a moment in time, a speck in the realm of eternity, whereby you may have to stand and Man. see the salvation of the Lord. This is, our, this is our problem. We're going through something, and we start to well up. We start to plan. We start to think of how we're going to get out of this situation. We start to do different things. We start to plan, plot, come up with ideas of how we're going to dig us out of that situation. And then we wonder why God suddenly takes all of those things that we are holding on to, grasping on to, standing on, and He removes them. And now we're hurting even worse. And now we're struggling even worse. Well, why did he do that? Because he doesn't want you to stand in the power of your own might. He wants you to stand in the power of God Almighty. Amen. And so he removes everything. And in the flesh, that feels terrible. Because suddenly, your finances that you were praying would get better are just worse. They're just falling apart and crumbling. Suddenly, your health that you're praying, God, make it better. I don't feel... It's worse. you got nothing. You're just falling. You're crumbling. You can't do anything. But you can always do one thing, Christian. You can stand in the power Amen. of His yeah. might. Be ready to see His glory at work. I know each and every one of us here wants to see God's glory. And Moses was the same way. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18 says this. And, I, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses asked this exact question. He says, I beseech thee, I'm asking you. God, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. You're not going to have any of my goodness not passing before thee at this moment. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. In other words, God's saying here, He's like, all my goodness is going to pass before you. And in your life, I am going to be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I'm going to show mercy. You will see my goodness. You will see my glory pass before you. But then He says this in verse 20, and He said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. 
God is going to reveal the entirety of his glory unto Moses, but he will not be able to see his face. The Bible is clear. No man hath seen God at any time. And that is God the Father. And yet we have the rock. We have the fountains of living water. We have Christ here upon earth, which we be can, which we can behold in his glory. Verse 21 says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, and I will, while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face thou shalt not see. So at this time, we have Moses saying, show me thy glory, and God says, you can't withstand it. You cannot behold my glory and live, but he says, but I will put you upon this rock. You shall stand upon this rock. I will hide you in the cleft of this rock and you shall be able to behold a part of my glory. We always pray that God would show us the immenseness of his glory. The reality is we can't handle it this side of heaven. And yet he provides the avenue by which we can see a glimpse of the glory of God. And that avenue is who? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. He says right here in the scripture when he says, the Moses says, God, I want to see your glory. He says, stand on Christ and you'll see my glory. Stand on Christ and you will see my glory pass by my face. You will not see, but you will be able to stand upon the sure foundation, which is described in Isaiah 28 and verse 16. You will be able to stand upon the rock that wise men build upon, according to Luke chapter 6. You will be able to stand upon the only foundation that will last throughout all eternity, as it says in 1 Corinthians 8, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. You'll be able to withstand if you're standing upon the rock. Now, if you can withstand the glory of God passing by you when you're standing on the rock, what is the glory of this world in comparison? Is that going to knock you over? Is that going to knock you down? Is that going to hurt you, harm you, the glory of this world next to the glory of the living God? Absolutely not. As a church, as a people, we need to stand on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and that is Jesus Christ Amen. himself. Amen. And if we are standing firm upon that rock, which is Christ, nothing will knock us over. Even the glory of God Almighty passing by us will not phase us. We will be protected within the cleft of the rock as the glory of God passes by shining upon our face. Amen. What is the smudge of this world smearing on by us? What is the filth of this world? What is the dirt? What is the dog in comparison next to the living God going to do to knock you off of that foundation? Nothing. Stand firm upon Christ the solid rock. That's our foundation. The same foundation of the apostles, the same foundation of the prophets is upon Christ himself. The word of God made flesh. How firm the foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. <clears throat> Hold fast, Christian. Stand firm. 2 Timothy says, the foundation of God standeth sure. You don't need to doubt. You don't need to worry. When you're standing upon the rock, it's sure. It's that it ain't moving anywhere. And if you're firmly placed upon his rock, you will not be budged, no matter what the world throws at you. Stand firm, stand strong. Trust forever. Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11. We'll go back there briefly. In Hebrews chapter 11, we all know this as the faith chapter. We've seen that we need to hold fast into Christ. We've seen that we need to stand firm on the solid rock, which is 
Christ. We need to understand that this isn't something that we need to do once in a while or from time to time. We need to trust forever, for always, believing, constantly abiding within the faith of Jesus Christ. Trust forever. Hebrews chapter 11 records this great hall of faith, we call it, where it recounts the whole of scriptures and, and gives story upon story, such as, by faith, Abraham. It says, by faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. And on and on and on. And this story continues in verse 32. And what more? And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. There are so many stories of these great men standing upon the promises of God, standing by faith upon the written word, upon the living word, upon the solid rock, holding fast unto him. We're to look to Jesus, who's eternal in heavens. We're to look to Jesus and be satisfied forever, just as these men were, just as these women were. And this is just a glimpse of what happened throughout all history. The Bible records here that many of these stories, many of these examples, are actually not even recorded. Look down in verse 33, it says, Who through faith, these men, subdued kingdoms and these women. They wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better, better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So many stories throughout history, even ones that aren't recorded in Bible, even ones that aren't recorded in history, of Christians going through much worse than we have ever faced. I believe in our time we may see much worse than we have ever faced to date come upon us. Not just sickness of flesh, but how about if Christians face cruel mockings and scourgings? How about if one day there is bonds and imprisonment to those who would hold to the scripture, to those who would stand firm on the promises of God? How about if Christians were stoned Sawn asunder. Don't think that I'm talking about some, some thing that could never happen. That is happening today on this planet. We live in a bubble called North America where we don't see all of the wrongs that are going in the outside world to those that profess the living God. Those that call upon Jesus for salvation and will not stand upon anything else, will not hold upon anything else. They face these things each and every day. In most of the Islamic world, if you convert, you're dead. If you believe on Christ for salvation and repent of Islam, you're dead the next day when they find out. This isn't some strange thing. The Apostle Peter said, think not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. So yeah, in this world, we go through sicknesses and trials and, and, and tribulations and maybe a few people in our family don't get along with us anymore. But we've never faced the fiery trial which Christians throughout history have faced. And yet, how did they do it? How did they overcome? How did they, how did they obtain a better resurrection through not facing deliverance when, when you're being tortured and asked to recant Christ? When you're being stoned and saying, just deny Christ, it'll stop. When you're being sawn asunder, and they're saying, it will all stop if you deny your Savior. How did they receive better deliverance? They did it because they 
held fast to, because they stood firm upon, and because they trusted forever, delivering God, which was able to deliver them. They believed on Jesus Christ, not just for their salvation, which is but a moment in time, and once you're saved, you're always saved, you're going to heaven forever, that it won't change, that will never stop, that lasts for eternity, but they trusted God beyond even that, to their everyday lives. Amen. And when they lived as if they truly believed on Christ every day of their lives, yeah, they started to face trials. Yeah, they started to face temptations. Yeah, they started to face struggles, being sawn asunder, being tortured, being yeah. all of these things, much worse than we've ever faced, when we get nervous about telling a family member that we've believed on, on Christ. For some people, they need to count the cost before they believe in Jesus. They understand that that may be the end of them, that may be the last thing that they ever do, is believe on Jesus by faith. And yet they believe so much that they're willing to bank and, and, and wager and give up their entire life for it. And yet we will just say a prayer, receive salvation, that's wonderful, and then we go on the rest of our days like, like nothing had ever happened, like nothing had ever changed. Now Christians need to be living the type of life that unfortunately gets us into trouble, that unfortunately has the world breathing down our necks, that unfortunately um, will have these types of situations come upon us, but we can't do it of ourselves. We can't do it in the power of our might. We need to do it in the power of the living God, trusting Him, doing what He wants us to do, and whatsoever comes, let it come. That's what the Bible says, it's a, it's a trial by fire. There are some things in our life that need to be burned off, and, and, and last, time, last time I checked, fire doesn't feel good. But when we go through the fire, what comes out on the other side? Everything that is pure. Everything that was not dross, was not an impurity, was not dirt, rust, whatever. The other side is clean. It is pure. It is purged of all that is dirty. And that's why Christians today, we will face that fiery trial, but we don't have to do it alone. We have the Holy Spirit residing within us. We have Christ sitting on the right hand of God the yeah. Father. We have God the Father who sent the Son to be the propitiation of the world to experience the feeling of our infirmity that He can understand and He can empathize with us when He leaned to the Father and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Father, give them strength. Give them grace. Give them comfort in the time of need. And the Father is willing because it was Him that first loved the world that He gave His Son. Yeah. He is willing to answer those prayers. The triune God living in eternity, ready to help the Christian through it. But without faith, it is possible to please Him. It is impossible to please God without believing in Him. It is impossible to receive the blessings of God without believing in Him and trusting Him. Simply trusting every day, trusting through the stormy way, even when my faith is strong, small. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Even if you have faith so small, you need to put it in the maker of all. You need to put that little bit of faith when you're in a trial. That little bit of faith when you're struggling. That little bit of faith when you're hurting. When everything is just falling apart. If you can give a mustard seed worth of faith to the living God, and just say, God help. He is waiting there to give you exactly what you need. And what we need is usually grace and help in that time. And all those are promised to those who believe, who hold fast, stand firm, and trust forever in the living God. Not just that saved them, but is waiting to save them right. out of their struggles. God is willing. God is able. God is ready. We just need to do our part. And what is our part? Faith. Man, trust, believe. Our, our part is to simply admit that I, I can't do it. I, I can't get out of this situation. I, 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 I've done it all, and I, I'm, I'm at a loss, and I'm losing, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, and I'm hurting. God, you do it. And in that moment, God is ready to behave, to be strong for those that have not strength of their own. And that is how you can see these people in the great hall of faith even the ones that are unnamed, innumerable multitudes throughout history have not accepted 
deliverance when being tortured, have faced the greatest of trials and hurts and harm that the world would have to throw at them, and they did it with a song in their heart. They did it by faith. And I love verse 38, that little verse there says, whom, of whom the world is not worthy. The world is not worthy to experience such joy that comes in the Christian's life when they act out by faith and go through the worst of things. But in that moment, they're closer than they've ever been to the living God, which abides forever.